Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines. Israeli forces injure hundreds of Palestinians in Braid and Al-Aqsa Mosque. At least 12 indigenous, indigenous people are injured in armed attack in Colombia. McDonald's workers go on strike for higher wages in the US. And in our video section, we take a look at the privatization of public services and the Brazilian government's neoliberal agenda. In our first story, at least 330 Palestinians were injured after Israeli forces raided the Al-Aqsa Mosque on May 10th. The Palestinian Red Crescent has confirmed that seven people are in critical condition. The medical aid organization has reported that a majority of the injuries were to the face and eyes. Israeli forces fired tear gas canisters, rubber bullets, uh, rubber coated steel bullets, and stun grenades at worshippers. Over 1,000 people were trapped inside the prayer rooms of the mosque during the attacks. Israeli forces also targeted the Red Crescent crews and ambulances to prevent them from reaching the wounded. Injuries were also reported after an Israeli settler ran over Palestinians with his car outside the mosque. The Wafa news agency reported that hundreds of settlers had gathered in the area under protection from the police. Monday's violence followed days after nearly 200 Palestinians were injured in a similar attack on the Al-Aqsa Mosque on May 7th. At least 90 Palestinians were injured in tear gas and stun grenade attacks on Saturday, that's the next day. Another 17 injuries were reported on Sunday as Israeli forces attacked people in occupied East Jerusalem. UNICEF reported that at least 29 Palestinian children were injured and eight were arrested between Friday and Sunday. Routine instances of violence have been reported from the Sheikh Jarrah locality. Nightly protests have been held against the court-ordered eviction of Palestinian families from the area. These have been met with severe forms of violence including tear gas and skunk water. Several protesters have also been arrested. Meanwhile, the Israeli Supreme Court has again postponed a hearing on the eviction of these families. Several far-right lawmakers and settlers marched into Sheikh Jarrah on Monday. Israeli forces then assaulted and arrested Palestinians from the neighborhood. Meanwhile, a march by Jewish extremist groups to commemorate Jerusalem Day continued despite being called off by the organizers. This was following police orders stating that the march could not pass through the Damascus Gate and Muslim Quarter. The Israeli news channel 12 reported on Monday evening that seven rockets had been fired towards the Jerusalem area from the Gaza Strip. This was following a warning by Hamas that all Israeli troops must withdraw from Al-Aqsa and Sheikh Jarrah by 6 p.m. The Al-Quds Brigade also announced that it had launched 30 rockets at the city of Centro. In our next story, we go to Colombia where at least 12 people were injured in an attack in the Cauca department on May 9th. They were part of an indigenous Minga heading to join the ongoing protests in the city of Cali. The Regional Indigenous Council of Cauca reported that the attacks had been carried out by men in civilian clothes. Footage showed that Colombian police were standing by idly as the indigenous people were shot and wounded. The council has also condemned the false allegations by the police. The police are now claimed that they were responding to reports of indigenous people attacking and firing at civilians. A press release further claimed that they were inciting terrorism, looting residential buildings and burning vehicles. Attacks were also reported at a university in the city. Members of the Minga had mainly gathered there to meet with the National Strike Committee. Heavy police presence including helicopters and riot police were reported at the site. Meanwhile, far-right President Ivan Duque has called for, a, for what he calls the largest deployment of police force in Cali. The CRIC has condemned the President's racist statements, asking indigenous communities to return to their territories to quote, avoid confrontations. The Colombian national strike against violence, inequality and neoliberalism entered its 12th day on May 9th. As the mobilizations continue to grow, rights groups have documented horrific levels of state violence. A joint report by Temblores and Indipaz released on Sunday has confirmed 47 killings so far. 963 arbitrary arrests and 111 firearm injuries have been recorded between April 28th. In our next story, we go to the US where thousands of McDonald's workers are set to go on strike on May 19th. The strike will be part of the National Day of Action called by the Fight for 15 campaign to demand a $15 per hour minimum wage. Workers will mobilize across the country in 15 cities including Flint, Los Angeles and Houston among others. A major picket and demonstration will also be held outside the McDonald's headquarters in Chicago. The strike action to demand living wages for workers will be held on the eve of the company's annual shareholder meeting. The Fight for 15 campaign has estimated that McDonald's made a profit of almost $5 billion in 2020. However, the company is still not committed to a living wage for its workers, despite them continuing to work through the pandemic. Workers' groups have estimated that an average McDonald's worker is paid $7.25 per hour. While the company had hinted at a limited wage hike last month, the details are yet not yet known. Workers are also demanding that the company withdraw its membership from the National Restaurant Association and the International Franchise Association. Both organizations have been at the forefront of lobbying against changes to federal minimum wage laws. The strike by McDonald's workers comes at a time when chain stores including fast food restaurants are reporting labor shortages. 
Trade unions have pointed to extremely low wages and unsafe conditions as the reasons behind the trend. Workers at a Dollar General store in Maine also launched an indefinite strike on May 3rd. And in our final story, we go to Brazil, where the right-wing government has introduced plans to privatize postal services. The measure is part of the National Plan of Privatization, which was announced by the administration of President Jair Bolsonaro. The plan has been opposed by workers, unions and experts who argue that it will lead to layoffs, among other problems. This will put a further strain on the working classes who are already facing increasing poverty and hunger. Here is a video feature by Brazil de Fato on this issue. Over 400,000 deaths by COVID-19 were not enough to stop the federal government's privatizations in Brazil. The most recent target of the Minister of Economy, Paulo Guedes, is the largest logistic operator in the country, the post office. According to data from the company, even during the pandemic and in regions to which access is difficult, 97% of the mail deliveries were on time. That includes books and school materials for over 5,200 Brazilian cities. We are doing all the essential services. We go everywhere. The post office has lost over 200 workers for COVID during the pandemic. And in that situation, the government is trying to accelerate the privatization of the company. The post office was included in the National Plan of Privatization by a decree Bolsonaro signed in April. In the Congress, the bill paving the way for the sale of the company is discussed with urgency. The post office has now over 90,000 workers. 85% of them are in operational areas. Privatization means layoffs. With all the unemployment and other problems we have been seeing, it will be really hard to relocate all that operational workforce when they return to the job market. Another state-owned company targeted for privatization is Eletrobras, the largest energy producer in Latin America. The agenda deepens the neoliberal project previously led by former presidents Michel Temer from 2016 to 2018 and Fernando Henrique Cardoso in the 1990s. Some economists say Brazil is going in the opposite direction of countries that manage the current crisis well. If we let the economy be ruled by so-called free market forces, the results will be the aggravation of income concentration, underdevelopment, difference and poverty, as well as less technological development. The private market does not lead these processes. The state sector does, and the literature has abundantly shown that to be true in Brazil and abroad. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.